Well, what's the right message? Because today, we're looking at people and saying, go ahead and die. We could help you. We know what the problems are. But we're not going to do it because you fail our drug morality test. That's not the right message, in my opinion, whatsoever. So I say, let's not hide programs like this from our children. Let's take them there. Let's let them speak to these drug-addicted people. What do you think they're going to tell them? Oh, look at me. You know, you want to look like me? I'm only 35. I know I look 60. It's been a hard life. You know, the worst mistake I ever made was starting down this road. You know, I got started because someone gave me a free sample. I thought it was cool. Whatever their reasons would be, they will tell our children, that's honest education. That's where we should go. This is an option. This is something that we should do. And no one can tell me that Swiss parents love their children any less than we do. But they see this. They're not any more drug tolerant than we are either. But they see a program that's working. They're becoming managers instead of moralists. These things work. And Sanho, you are, you are an authority, as much as anyone I know, with regard to the problems of drug prohibition brought on, please stop it, brought on by uh, drug prohibition in these countries. I will tell you the truth. We could bulldoze Colombia. You could take Peru and Bolivia with it if you wanted to, and it wouldn't make any idea or any difference whatsoever with regard to our drug problems here in our country. Why? Because if the demand is here, the demand will be met. Do I need to say it again? If the demand is here, the demand will be met. And if it's not met by Colombia, Peru, and Bolivia, it'll be met by Nigeria, or Thailand, or Myanmar Republic, or California. <laughs> you know, if the demand is here, the demand will be met. The head of the DEA, now several years ago now, was quoted as saying, at any one time, there are 200 tons of cocaine in Mexico being warehoused within three miles of our border, simply waiting for there to be a scarcity so that they can smuggle it into Akron or Tennessee or, you know, wherever there's a scarcity. I've been quoted in Mexico, in Mexican newspapers I was interviewed, telling them, you should legalize these drugs. You should legalize these drugs. You know, since President Calderon has come up with his own war on drugs, and I don't, don't certainly hold it against him for his intentions, 28,000 Mexicans have died a violent death as a result of this. So even he is now talking about the possibility, the discussion of legalizing these drugs. So is Vicente Fox. Bless him for that, too. What would happen with regard to our country? Nothing. You know, we couldn't have more of these drugs available if we tried. So it wouldn't make any difference with regard to our country, but they could start regulating, taxing, controlling, and getting rid of these drug cartels. Colombia, with great fanfare. We finally brought down the Medellin cartel, right? Oh, victory in the newspapers and everything else. That wasn't a victory. Within about an hour and a half, the Cali cartel was up and running. So years, 10 years later, we finally brought down the Cali cartel. What happened? Nothing. Now it's still there. We went to war against Panama. You know, Manuel Noriega, I'm told there's more drugs coming through Panama today than ever before. And you take it at my level. I'm a trial court judge in Orange County, California, and I'm here to tell you, I've talked with a lot of undercover DEA agents and other people in the government privately, and they'll tell you, no one in law enforcement will tell you with a straight face that we seize more than 10% of the illegal drugs in our society, and the more candid ones will tell you the truth, which is, it's about 5%. So when you look and see yet another photo opportunity where we've seized a ton of cocaine, and by the way, you can't fathom how much a ton of cocaine is, with all these drugs and all this cash and all this other stuff, it's not a victory. It's only a symptom of the depth of the problem, because for every ton we seize, we fail to seize somewhere between 10 and 15 tons. And that gets through, and that gets sold. And the other insidious thing, you wonder why I'm doing this, why I'm not sitting at home going to the beach? talking with people, traveling around the country, and trying to spread this alarm. I really believe, I'm a former Peace Corps volunteer, as, as you have heard. I believe the most patriotic thing I can do for the country I love is to help us repeal drug prohibition. It's the most insidious, maybe well-intended, although it actually has its roots in racism and empire-building and ignorance, but we'll take that aside for the moment. 
It's the most insidious thing we are inflicting upon our people. It does not take a sociologist to go through any jail or prison in our country and see that people of color are vastly disproportionately represented. And honestly, I'll go and talk with black churches or Hispanic churches or groups or whatever, and I'll look square at them and get upset, get mad at them and say, what's the matter? If people that looked like me had their children in jail as much as people that looked like you, we wouldn't stand for it. We would have changed away from this failed policy years ago. Why are you so quiet? Only now are they beginning to speak up. The guns of the war on drugs are mostly aimed at people of color. And you can go through, I wrote it in my book, and it's true. The roots of drug prohibition are racist. Originally, cocaine was made illegal because we were afraid of those black males that would take advantage of our white females. Mexico was the... We didn't care about marijuana. In fact, you can look at the congressional record. The people in Congress didn't even know what marijuana was in the early 1930s. Oh, they saw this movie Reefer Madness, you know, and stupid stuff like that. But it was those Mexicans. And they're going to use this, they called it narcotic, which of course it isn't, to basically lead astray white women. You know, okay, as a judge, I'll enforce the law. I, I don't have to do it quietly, witness what I'm doing now. But, you know, if it has its roots in racism, shame on us. That does not make me proud. Another reason it doesn't make me proud? The United States of America leads the world in the incarceration of our people. And here I assure you, you know, I'm from UCLA. We're number one is good. Doesn't happen very often recently in football and basketball, but we're coming back. But nevertheless, we lead the world in the incarceration of our people. Here, we're number one. Does that make you proud? 5% of the world's population and 25% of its prisoners, many of which are there because of this failed policy of war on drugs. So I'll, I'll end this diatribe for the moment and say, you know, the Rand Corporation came out with a study, June of 1994, that said we get seven times more value for our tax dollar by drug treatment than we do for incarceration, even for heavy-using drug-addicted people. Where are the headlines? Again, where's the media? Anybody here care about how your tax money is spent? Seven times more value for our tax dollar by drug treatment than we do in incarceration, even for heavy-using drug-addicted people. So the message, once again, former federal prosecutor, trial court judge for 25 years, let's remove our policy to hold people accountable for what they do, not what they put into their bodies, and we'll begin to make real, real progress, Sanho. Get busy. That's a great summary of one of the most complex and interdisciplinary problems confronting us today. Um, and I'm sure we have lots of different questions in this audience coming from all sorts of different perspectives. Um, and so before you ask your question, please uh, identify yourselves and, um, and ask away. So, any, uh, well, you're not going to tell me that I've answered all questions. And this is the most fun part for me. Yes, well, down here. Person. Uh, was, my, ma my name is Marcus Trelane, and I'm the Chief Operating Officer of the Children's Rights Council. And I've uh, listened to your, to your arguments very intently here. And I have one question that came to mind that you've addressed in a couple of different ways. And putting it in different terms, follow the money. Without opening up another can of worms from a similar scenario, what does the Presidential Administration and Congress think of the option of legalizing marijuana or anything else, because the option being this still falls under federal legislation. So if Proposition 19 were to pass, what is the potential, and I'm assuming somebody's already spoken, spoken with some of the members of the administration, to say we are not going to allow Proposition 19 to pass? It's, it's a real issue, and of course the answer is I don't know. Uh, but I am absolutely convinced that if we in California pass Proposition 19, which I devoutly hope we do, the Obama administration is facing an election in two years, you may have noticed, and they are not going to thumb their noses at the voters of California. So just like the Obama administration honored the concept of federalism, honored the concept of states' rights and the, what we were talking about earlier, allow each state to decide how best to serve its people, they did that with regard to medical marijuana. 
Uh, they said, through the Attorney General Eric Holder, in a memorandum to all U.S. attorneys, as long as people are in compliance with state and local laws on medical marijuana, we're not going to interfere. And I applaud that enormously. That's exactly what they should have done. I'm completely convinced that they will do the same thing with regard to Prop 19. They will probably come out and say, oh, this is silly, oh, you were duped, oh, you're misled, it'll never work, but we're going to let you do it. And then, honestly, it's going to work. It's not going to be, it's not going to be wonderful, but it will be less harmful. It will start to work. It will start to bring normalcy back. Uh, the Mexican drug cartels will start making less money. Uh, prison or gangs or juvenile gangs will make less money, etc. And the revenues will come in. The quality will be there. So I'm convinced that that's what's going to happen. But understand, 